uh, good afternoon everyone welcome to another episode of in conversation with bright minds and today we have with us uh, ms kirti malela she is um, an excellent uh, scholar in economics and is currently doing phd in economics from wits pilani so welcome to the show kirti hi thank you thank you for having me so uh, kirti we would like to understand from the very start how uh, you know you came uh, in the field of economics and why did you choose to do masters in economics and and i see that you also did mphil and then followed it by phd so you know why did you take this route uh, from bachelor's to phd okay uh, i'm a I'm a science graduate as far as plus one plus two is concerned. Um, I did my math, physics, and chemistry because uh, I've been a, I mean, you know, quite a good student in uh, mathematics and science since my school days. But then um, I had a sort of flavor inclination towards economics since quite an early age uh, because uh, my grandfather was qualified in economic he was an MA economics so probably you know the flavor started from there uh, so what happened was i wanted to do ba economics but in those days i'm talking about 99 maybe 97 99 so um it was not very popular ba ba ec was not very popular and one had to do ba honors and the place where i was living in hyderabad in telangana present telangana uh, ba honors was not very popular and the job prospects so the career prospects for a ba economics and then later an ma economics was not really you know very usual or it it was quite uncommon so i decided i'd do an allied subject uh, i took up um, uh, you know bachelor's in commerce and my main subjects there were uh, macro and microeconomics and uh, i was a university topper in statistics applied statistics there and then uh, i did my masters in finance so that was actually very helpful because it helped me understand you know what happens you know how a household actually decides what it wants to do what a firm decides you know uh, when it has some funds with itself for example so uh, then uh, my mphil was in financial economics which was you know a branch of you know of economics and finance um there also i couldn't take up pure economics because i had a background in finance i didn't want to take up pure economics also um i did my mphil because i wanted to later on do my doctorate so um then i joined my doctorate and i completed my doctorate in this april 2023 i've been awarded a doctorate in economics my field of interest my field of research is macroeconomics so that's what i have been doing so then you switched from financial economics to macroeconomics yeah complete economics now <laughs> okay <laughs> yes got it mm. so so um, you know how is it like for example bits pilani is uh, is more of a managerial institute as people get to know about it so um, you, how how is it that uh, you know how is the culture there regarding phd's and um how are the professors there if if one wants to do a phd in economics from there okay um we have uh, a campus in hyderabad bits pilani has a campus in hyderabad that's the hyderabad campus the uh, economics and finance faculty are in one department so um the the faculty is young and dynamic they are focused on publications and uh, they are extremely good mentors my uh, mentors were dr sunny kumar singh and dr rachna shivastava both very dynamic and um, till about a few months back ugc had a uh, a regulation uh, about the scholars that at least two papers must come out in scopus index scopus index journals um fortunately with the guidance of my very able fantastic supervisors one of my publications out of the three that you know got published uh, one of my publications was in an a grade journal and it, it a very high impact factor journal so all because of my supervisors i would say 
so this regulation was there and the supervisors guide the scholars extremely well in this case not just this if the scholar is a good performing one they get opportunities to also participate in projects that are financed by external organizations let's say by icssr or eria or the monash university or you know unscap i had been part of two such projects one was the uns cap and the monash university project during my phd so one of them is in the process of publication as well so uh, this is as far as the you know capabilities of the faculty is concerned culture wise it's like any other university they've got um, you know very good infrastructure the library facilities are extremely good and of course it's a residential campus so the residences are very well maintained and it's a very beautiful campus if you've seen the hyderabad campus it's beautiful so that's about it yeah got it so uh, do they also have by any chance part time phd's or it is only They, they do, do they do they do yes okay. and of course the stipend is actually very competitive for the full time phd students oh okay yes okay. yes yeah. so what happens post phd um are you eligible for going ahead i mean you are eligible of course but do they also go ahead and take people as professors within their university or uh, you know you have to look out for opportunities outside some have gotten employed in uh, the hyderabad campus uh, my senior um dr swati she is i think um around 4 years senior to me 5 years senior to me she is employed there as an associate professor right now in uh, management which management i'm not your sure, marketing or any other but management yes so um that's uh, of course they take in you know uh, recently graduate scholars or mm. you know scholars which who are you know in let's say they have finished their pre submission seminars they are eligible to apply in fact i had um, uh, not applied to the hyderabad campus because i don't live there but i had applied to you know xi mean bangalore i got selected then um, Uh, there are opportunities right from the pre submission seminar uh, the the time you give a pre submission seminar there are like a host of opportunities open to the phd grads so that's not an issue at all got it got it so so you had also been a teacher associate at yes. iim bangalore right so uh, it was before you were doing phd or simultaneously along with uh, your phd program? no mine was a full time phd so i was engaged completely at the hyderabad campus um i worked in iim bangalore way before my phd as a ta and uh, when uh, as soon as my gave my pre submission i got employed in iim bangalore again as a research fellow okay so um that was kind of a post doctoral hmm. so yeah so after that i think yeah after that i was employed in gram here which is uh, in bangalore grassroots research and advocacy Sorry. movement yeah. yeah again as an economist slash research fellow um i got to work with you know one of the best social scientists in india dr basav raju he is very well known okay. so um that's it now i'm setting up something on my own so as is so with fun. you know most of the bits pilani grads <laughs> yes got it got it. actually that was my next question so you know uh, mostly people who do phd are um, you know they're more oriented towards becoming a professor right so um, how come you didn't uh, you know go towards that direction and you you so as i see from your profile you went for being a being a research associate or being an economist yeah. and not towards that field of of teaching per se good question uh the thing is that i'm not uh i'm not very uh, you know adept at teaching I, i'm not a very good teacher and uh, probably my interest doesn't lie there i'm going to just put it that way i am more of a researcher i i get all my satisfaction from research finding out how something can happen why something cannot happen in this way but then why is it happening in some other way so that profound in depth research like you know my most recent research uh, issue that i had taken up is in equality income inequality so why inequality exists not just drawing a trend line you know i think that's the reason i did my doctorate also to find the appropriate methodology to find certain answers you know uh, so 
that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in profound research, why something happens, why something cannot happen in the same method, why it happens with another method, not just numbers, but then, you know, the theory and the policy perspectives behind it. This is what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. So, mm. uh, so you are now settled at, in Bangalore, right? Yes. Yes. So, so definitely a new startup is, is on the way. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. And it's going to be in the field of economics, right? Yes. I mean, yes. In the field of research. Mm. Got it. So, um, you know, one thing I wanted to understand uh, now MPhil is no more required to do right. PhD. But do you think MPhil actually plays a role in, in PhD? Does it help you in some way or a student? If if because now we're going to miss out on MPhil and directly do PhD, right. does, is it is it going to impact the way that PhD is going to take place for students? Um, okay, I'd say this MPhil is nothing but your prep for PhD, isn't it? I I think you know that. So um, in MPhil, what I did was I I'll, I'll tell you you know what uh, people would teach in MPhil. So um, I would learn about research methodology. So there are two parts, uh, if you're aware. So research methodology one and two, that's taught in MPhil. And basic econometrics, that's taught in MPhil as well. So uh, we learn about probability, a little bit of calculus and things like that. So basically, it's for people who are not qualified in finance, who are not qualified in economics at all. Let's say they've come from marketing, marketing management, and somebody wants to do a PhD. So... Um, that, you know, that way MPhil would have helped. But then um, I think maximum, you know, several universities right now in India and abroad, they have, uh, you know, introduced such courses, very good courses in research methodology. In fact, in Bits Pilani or, uh, you know, in the Hyderabad campus, as far as I know, and, you know, some other universities, research methodology is taught not by economists. They are taught by not only economists, I would say, they're taught, they're taught even by physicists. So that's a very broad spectrum learning and it really helps. So it's it's a good thing that it is removed. It's, it's a waste of time. So, <laughs> so PhD's preparation goes on in the first year. So that's perfect. Okay, got it. Uh, so uh, one more thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I was just having a word with some other people in um, who, who are doing PhD. And, uh, you know, they told me that PhD has a very high opportunity cost because you don't get as good packages as a corporate job would have paid you. Uh, especially in India, the packages and I mean, not the package, the stipend that, that you yeah, get for yeah. the five years is not that competitive as compared to corporate job. So what is that one motivation that keeps you going for PhD, given that, you know, for the next five years, you will be indulged in so extensive research. And, you know, for example, I wanted to do PhD, but once I got campus placement, after two years, I could not think back of going towards the PhD direction just because, you know, the package kept growing again. It kept growing and then somehow I got deviated from the fact that I actually would have enjoyed doing PhD more. So hmm. what is that one thing that keeps you on route that even if my peers might be in the corporate sector, but this is something which is going to give me more um, satisfaction in the long run? Mm, one very simple, very hardcore motivation is the passion for research. Okay, because uh, the stipend, as you said, correctly said, the stipend in India is not very high. Um, so maximum 40k that's i think that's what isb pays i don't know 48 maybe mm -hmm. how is it enough to survive if you are you know married for example and you're one of the breadwinners for example mm -hmm. so that's not really enough so i'd say the main motivation is your passion towards research towards finding answers and uh, your potential you know in future uh, you know let's say in four and a half years or four years for that matter you can get employed immediately in you know an academic role as an assistant prof so um that's one yes right. so these two are but then if you talk about the competitiveness about of you know the assistant professorship salaries and the corporate salaries corporate salaries are high but then again uh the research oriented jobs that i i was in a research oriented job mm -hmm. i was an economist till recently i mean employed economist so my compensation as an economist where i was working was higher than what a beginning assistant professor would earn so it's a choice hmm. 
And does it help to do a PhD degree when it comes to looking out for roles as economist? Would you be um, more uh, paid more than what a master's degree person would be paid for the same role? A master's, let's say MA economics, for example, an MA economics with around 15, 20 years of experience, 15 years of experience would be paid probably around the same as a PhD with no experience. Okay. Yeah. That, that's, that's so, yeah. 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 So, because, uh, see, um, an economist's job is not just finding, as I said, trend lines or, you know, making histograms and all that. He has to find the relevance of, you know, an equation or a model. Um, he also has to find out how to uh, expand the model in a macroeconomic sense and how to, you know, uh, what do you say, disaggregate the model in terms of, you know, a household effect, for example. So that comes only with, you know, the knowledge of the methodology that goes behind finding an answer. Got so it. a PhD is essential to become an econ economist. Yes. To become an economist. Got it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just one last question I have for you. So given that uh, very recently, a woman uh, won the you know Nobel Prize in economics. Yeah, <laughs> what are your views on it? She is amazing. She's not the first one, isn't it? In the recent times, Esther Duflo was you know but, before, but, an, but an individual one now. Oh, of course, of course, Claudia, isn't it? Yeah, she's amazing. So finding something about gender pay gap is uh, gender pay gap is not a very you know um, recent issue that's come up just this year. Gender pay gap is quite an old one, uh, but then you know doing so much research, you know, worth two hundred years of insight is is not easy. And she's done an amazing job. Uh, and probably being a woman has you know inspired her, motivated her more to find out about you know what goes behind gender pay, pay gap and how has it been for example um we're talking 200 years back so we're talking about you know let's say gender pay pay gap in england when you know servants were employed you know and uh, there is a pay gap between men and you know male and female servants for example so she's done an amazing job she's wonderful <laughs> <laughs> right yes. yes so um thank you so much for your time kirti and i hope thank that you. You know, in the future, uh, once your startup is established, uh, you do employ a few students from us also who are doing masters. Of course, in economics. of course, of course. <laughs> okay. Always, yes. Okay, yeah. sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. For Thank you time. so much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.